Okay. So I'm just glad that you guys are here. I'm glad we have this time together um, and just share together. Now, I'm, I'm speaking, the name of the sermon is Scared to Death. Okay, and some of you are thinking, Pastor, how many times are you going to preach on fear this year? Well, this is the year of fear, so I'm, I'm getting it all in. Okay, on this year, how many, you remember, how many of you remember uh, Y2K? You remember that? You remember the year of 2000? You remember our computers were all going to stop, our clocks going to stop, our automobiles wouldn't run, the world was going to come to an end, right? It didn't. They all kept running. I don't know. I don't know who built those things that said they were only going to last thirty years. You know, like what? Who was the, in charge of computers back then? You know, where they built them? You know, what thirty-two million years? It slipped up on them somehow. That Y two K made it. You know, they got caught. So I don't know. I don't always trust them in that process. And so uh, here we are with this year, and this year has certainly carried its own fear. And I've developed my own little anxiety, my own fear. It's called phobophobia. And that's the fear of fear. So I have the fear of fear this year. That kind of rhymes. Fear of fear this year. And so uh, that's what we're dealing with. And so I'm talking about scared to get to death. Now, God doesn't want us to be captured, captivated, froze up uh, by fear. Okay? And too many people live in fear all the time, okay? And we burn a lot of energy, we burn a lot of time, we burn a lot of anxiety, we experience a lot of anxiety, all dealing with fear. Fear can just control us way, way too much. In fact, there are some people that get so caught up in fear that they actually worship the ruler of fear, and they end up in actually worship in the dark realm, or worship the darkness, or worship the fear, uh, in hopes to overcome that's fear. That's how jacked up we get when we start dealing with fear in our lives, okay? And God, there's only one fear that God wants us to have. The scripture tells us there's one phobia that God wants us to have. It's called theophobia. It's the fear of God. That's what it says. I just made up that word. I'm not sure if it's called theophobia, but it should be because that's kind of the Greek word God. And so uh, anyway, that, that, that fear of God, that's the only fear uh, that God wants us to have. And he wants us to have that fear in us so strong that we will actually be willing to die to ourselves. See, if we're going to be scared to death, we need to be scared to death of God. Because if that way, if we're scared enough or have enough fear of the Lord, or we will put ourselves to death and pick up our cross daily and follow him, we'll begin to live the way that God wants us to live. But that's the only fear that we're given permission as God's people to have. And that's the only, Now, we got some real bizarre fears, okay? I already mentioned a couple of them this morning. Uh, a couple of weird fears. Uh, how many of you have, have ever heard of the fear uh, arithmophobia? Okay. Have you ever heard of that? That's the fear of numbers. How many of you have a fear of numbers? As a pastor counting the congregation this year that show up on Sunday, I begin to develop this fear. All right. And so I have arithmophobia. Uh, you may have uh, heard of, oh, plutophobia. Have you ever heard of plutophobia? It's the fear of money. Any of you have that? Any of you have the fear of cash? Okay, that'd be called flutophobia if you have that, all right? Another one is called nomophobia. Some of you have this. You know what nomophobia is? It's the fear of being caught without your cell phone, okay? That's called nomophobia, you know? I can't make no more connections to anybody. <laughs> that messes me up, right? So you might have nomophobia. I don't know. That, that might be something that you have. Uh, there's also, ab how do you say this? Uh, I would say ablutophobia, okay? Ablutophobia. Any of you have this? Your children may. It's the fear of bathing. Anybody have the fear of bathing? All right? Some of you? I don't know. Talking to you this morning, I have my questions about that, all right? You know? Uh, there's another one uh, that I found. Oh, this is a great one. Ergophobia. Anybody heard of ergophobia? It's called the fear of work, all right? Usually breakouts happen somewhere in the area of Washington, D.C., in those type of areas you'll find uh, ergophobia will really break out. Here's a final one. I have to wrap it up with this. Ecclesiophobia, the fear of church. Any of you have that one? Ecclesiophobia, all right? You may have that, all right? Some of you have developed it this year, but you're beginning to break out of it. I see that. That's good. That's awesome that you're coming back, you know? And uh, so there, there's so many different, you know, phobias, and I don't mean to make fun of fear because we have a lot of fear, but Romans chapter 8, verse 15, and the scripture says this, 
It says, the spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship and by him cry, Abba, Father. The, you know, what we've received, the spirit that we receive as believers is a, a spirit of having the openness to go into the presence of the heavenly Father. Therefore, we don't have to fear anything else. We don't have to fear anything. God did not give us a spirit of fear. We don't have to live with that. Because we're believers, we've been delivered out of fear, and we never, ever, ever have to go back into living in fear. We've been set free from that. We can't be scared to death anymore. We're over that. We're beyond that. We push past that. I love Psalms 34, 4. It says this, I prayed to the Lord and he answered me. He freed me from all my fears. God promises us the freedom from fear if we will just ask, if we'll go to the Lord, seek the Lord, ask him to take away our fear, our phobias. No matter what type of phobia or fear we might have, God can deliver us from that fear and from that phobia. And so I just want us to focus on this idea a little bit. I want us to take a look at some, some really biblical reasons not to fear. Now, I broke these up into two categories just so I could sound more intelligent today. Um, the first one, there's some, uh, the first one, I want us to look at some theological reasons. I want to look at some real deep Bible reasons, concepts about God, uh, three of those of why we, we should, don't need to fear and should not fear. And then I want us to come and look at some practical reasons that God gives us because that we are his. He makes some practical promises to believers, to those that accept him, to those that receive him. So if you're looking today and trying to find, you know, why do we not fear? Why should we not fear as God's people? These things are really going to help you out, okay? But first of all, there's some theological reasons. Because as a believer, Christ is in you, and now you have a personal relationship with God through Jesus, okay? And because of that, it brings some theological ramifications that oversee all other things that we might face. And these theological ramifications really kind of, uh, you know, give us the strength and the confidence that we need to overcome any kind of fear that we might face in life, okay? Now, uh, did some people were, do you notice that some people were dressed up today because our children are having their, you know, pre-Halloween, you know, ce celebration time or harvest festival, I don't know, whatever we're supposed to call that. And, well, someone asked me today, what are you dressing up in? I said, I'm an evangelist. Obviously, I put a jacket on today, all right? So I'm dressed up as a TV evangelist today. And uh, so don't get confused, you know, you, those of you online that are listening today, uh, it is still... Pastor Les, okay? And so anyway, let's look at some of those theological reasons. The one, the one uh, theological reason, the first one is this, that because we have a personal relationship with God, that means that we're connected to the one who is before, who is, excuse me, before it all. The one who is before it all. The second reason is because we're connected to the one who is above it all. The third reason is because we're connected to the one who has authority over it all. But first of all, we're connected to the one who is before it all. Look at Colossians chapter 1 verse 17. It says this about Jesus. It says, He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. As a believer, I'm connected to the one who was before anything. Before anything was, he is. Before anything was created, he existed. Jesus existed uh, even before the beginning of time. He was a part of the Godhead. He was connected to God. He chose himself to break down and come to this earth and to break into our history so that he could deliver us and save us from sin, so that he could go to the cross and die for us. That was his choice. He limited himself on purpose so that he could become fully human fully God, and down across for us. Jesus chose to do that. So I have a relationship, or we have a personal relationship, the one, he, he's going to hold it all together. We don't have to have the fear that it's all going to fall apart because Jesus holds it all together. And some people, when I say that, some people will tell me, they say, well, Pastor, you don't believe in science? Oh, yeah, I believe in science. Why would I not believe in science? It'd be silly not to believe in science. Jesus created the science, okay? God created science. There's no reason I wouldn't believe that. Anything that we study in science, we're studying the creativity or the activity of God. So, of course, I believe the science. I just always don't always trust the scientists, 
okay? Sometimes they make me a little nervous, you know? Research costs money, and someone has to put up the money for the research. And the research can tend to influence the outcome of what's going on because you've got to do the right research on the right topic if you're going to give you the right kind of money. And the only thing that researchers like more than money is more money, you know what I mean? And so I don't always trust that because scientists don't always agree. Theologians don't always agree, okay? People that, that believe, you know, their thoughts about God, we're not always together. Doctors never agree on anything. Scientists don't always agree. If, you, if someone's telling you they all agree one way or another, they're wrong because that's not true. They don't always agree on everything. They, you know, we can't even agree on how to handle, you know, the virus that we're facing right now. It's always a little bit up in the air. So I, I know this, I trust this, I trust behind the science that Jesus is the one that holds everything together. Now, why would I say that? Because we live in this world that's made up of mass, okay? It's, it's made this, this thing, stand here thing is made up of mass. This chair is made up of mass, okay? And that mass is made up of all of these little bitty particles, okay? It, it's made up of the atom. And the atom is made up of, of what? Protons, electrons, neutrons, and croutons. It's made up of all of that stuff, okay? Wait, this is 20th century science, okay? We're in 21st century, that's right. And so anyway... Uh, maybe not croutons, but food has to be at the heart of everything, right? You know? And so we got protons, the electrons, the neutrons, they're all in here together in this atom. And we find that if we break that atom, <clears throat> there's incredible power that exists. It causes this, this amazing, incredible, you know, hard to explain explosion that takes place. And, and we're looking at that and trying to figure out what is that power that holds together. And I can just theologically save them a lot of trouble. But the scripture says it's Jesus that holds all things together. He's the power that holds it all together. And I know we get worried about it, and we're worried that it might get a little hotter, this matter that we live in. Well, according to Scripture, it's going to be a whole lot hotter someday. We just don't want to be here when that happens. We want to be sure we're in heaven by then, right? So you might want to go, sh go ahead and take care of that right up front. Just go ahead and get that taken care of. So theologically, we understand that I don't have to be that afraid of the things that cause fear because I'm connected to the one who is before it all, and he holds it all together. And then the Bible says that we're also connected to the one who is above it all, okay? Look at John 3, 331. It says, God's son comes from heaven and is above all others. Jesus is above all over, uh, all others. He resides over everything. And Jesus has the sovereignty and the grace to do it. He has the sovereignty and the grace to pull it off, to make it happen. Uh, you remember uh, some years ago, Jim Carrey was in the movie, and he got assigned the assignment to be God for a while. Do you remember that? Or to take the place of God. <clears throat> and you remember how he started getting a whole lot of emails? All of the prayer requests, he started handling the prayer requests. And, of course, everybody prayed by email back then. I don't know what that is. You know? And so, uh, he, you know, probably today, I don't know, maybe... You know, he would have been on Facebook or something or Face God or whatever they would want to call that for him. And, and so, and, and, and he's getting all these emails and all these emails coming in. He's overwhelmed. He can't handle all of these. And so what does he do? He just tells everybody, yes, is the answer to whatever they ask. Remember that? He just says, okay, it's, if you ask it, you get it. Yes. All right. That's a disaster. That never works out good. We need to learn that in this country a little bit. Sometimes you just got to learn to say no, you know. One time, uh, I remember years and years ago, President Reagan, uh, when, when he, well, he was just a governor this, at this time, and they asked him this, they, they said, what do you think the answer is to balancing the budget as American people? And he said, well, it's a lot like trying to keep your virtue. He said, you just have to learn to say no. Sometimes we just got to learn. They, they thought he was funny. You didn't think I was funny when I said that? Well, he, he was funny. You know, when, once you get on virtue in church, it gets a little, a little edgy there. I get that, Okay. And, and so he, sometimes we just have to say no. Well, Jim Carrey said yes, and everything fell apart. It just doesn't work that way. We never are good at being God because we don't have the sovereignty and we don't have enough grace to do it the way that God wants us to do it. Let's, let's look just maybe a little bit more biblical. You remember Moses in the Old Testament when Moses faced a situation when he was leading God's people? And his father-in-law had to come to him and give him some advice. Now listen, 
when you have to get advice from your father-in-law, you're spiritually messed up, okay? You're in a bad place, all right? So Moses is in a bad place because not only does he get the advice, he takes the advice. So you know he knew he was in a bad place, all right? And so his father-in-law came to him and he said, Moses, your, tra- your ruling of the people is killing you. You're trying to run it by yourself. You're trying to make every decision. You're trying to, to rule every case is brought to you. And, and you're like the judge of everything. And he says, you've got to break this down. Let some other people help you. Let other people be the judges underneath you so that they can better take care of the people. And he reorganized the way that Moses was running God's people. Why? Because Moses wasn't God. He was trying to be God. You can't be God. We don't make good gods because we don't have the sovereignty. We don't have the grace that God has. We don't have the grace and sovereignty that Jesus has. We have to learn to trust God because he is above it all. He rules it all. He's the authority we'll find over it all. And so we have to learn just to trust that in order to overcome our fear. So some theological reasons to not, be, not have fear is that we're connected relationally, the one who is before it all, the one who is above it all, and also the one who has authority over it all. Jesus has authority. Now, why was the early church in Acts so powerful? Why did God move so aggressively? I mean, the scripture tells us that they met from house to house. They would have little group studies and then also that they would come and worship together. We know that the temple would probably hold around 50,000 people. They probably had 100,000 people worshiping. So they would have two, they'd have to have two services. They had the early and late service, you know, in order to make that happen, in order to fit anybody in. The city of Jerusalem, 200,000 people had over 100,000 people come to Christ, believe in Christ, trust Christ in just a few years. It was an incredible miracle of power, okay? The church was so powerful that basically the government could pretty well shut down all of their support programs because the church was feeding everybody, taking care of anybody. The government didn't have to spend a dime on it. They could dime on it. They could lower taxes, you know, and they could make it happen for the people a little bit. The church was that powerful. There was that much of a movement. It just began to explode. Why was the church so powerful? And the reason is because the church was unified with Jesus as the authority over it. They established him as the authority. They believed in the authority. They trusted the authority. They worked and and lived their lives under the authority. And the authority of Jesus in their life transformed everything for them. That's where the power comes from. The power comes as we unify, not under some earthly human being, but as we unify under the authority of Jesus. And his authority begins to take over our lives. And he begins to direct our lives. And we commit our lives to living the way he wants us to live. And all of a sudden, the fear is gone and the power comes in. And we live life the way that Jesus and God would want us to live our lives. In the fullness of Christ. Remember John 10, 10, I came that you might have fullness and have it to its completeness, God's goal for us, okay? So there's some theological reasons right there that are really cool, that really help us say, okay, I don't have to be scared to death. I don't have to have fear. I don't have to have phobophobia. I can get over that. I can be delivered from that, and I can live the way that God wants me to live. So there's some theological reasons. But also, you got time for three more? There's some practical reasons, all right? Okay, you got time, right? Hey, it, 9.30 service is awesome because at 10.30, I can go to the pump house. I can be eating brunch by 11, easy. Isn't that cool? I like that. So I can meet both phys- spiritual need and physical need by lunchtime. Rest of the day is a nap in a football game, right? <laughs> or baseball, maybe today, you know, I don't know, whatever it is for you. Could mow the yard. Ah, I'll go with the football and that thing. That's all right. All right. So here's some practical reasons because as a believer, Christ is in you. And because of that, God gives us some very practical promises. And these promises are phobia busters. Oh, that would have been a good title too. Phobia busters. All right. Number one. First of all, Jesus says this, I will save you. We're promised that by God. That's his nature. That's who he is. He promises to save us. Isaiah 43, 1 says, Do not be afraid. I will save you. God has always been in the business of saving people. He's in the salvation business. Isn't that cool? He promises that. You know that I will save you. He will save you spiritually. 
He will save you physically. He will save you emotionally. He will save you relationally. There's no way he can't save you. If you will just trust him and let him deliver you. I will save you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Isn't there, man, there's nothing like being saved and personally called by your name when it's done. You know, Leslie, Cole, Pastor, Les, I'm saving you. It's personal. It's for me. I, I, there's times, man, I need somebody just to call out my name, you know. When I show, you know, don't you like it when you show up for church and someone says, well, hey, hi, Nancy or Bob or Joe or Ron or whatever your name is, right? Don't you like that? When, when, when people, you know, it feels good. It's like, oh, well, they know me here, you know. And so that, 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 that's awesome. Jesus calls us by name. Now, I remember one time I was, uh, oh, I had just barely turned 18, okay? This, this was like 20 years ago at least <laughs> and uh, maybe more. <laughs> And I just turned 18, and and I had committed myself to doing what God wanted me to do. And so uh, someone told me, man, you need to get into some remissions. So I was like, man, I'm going to get in some remissions. They go, you can go to some exotic places like Alaska and like, you know, Michigan and California. Some really cool places, you know, do work. And I was like, oh, man, I got to sign up for that. So I signed up, and my assignment was to Fort Hood, Texas. In the summer when it was like 112 degrees, okay? So I went to Dallas, Texas, and I did some training. We went through some training together. And then I never forget, I got on a second-class bus, Red Arrow bus, didn't even have air conditioning in Dallas, Texas. Okay, I've just turned 18, barely, okay? I get on this bus, and I ride to Colleen, Texas with about 10 hookers, Okay? No, well, I wasn't with them, but they were on a bus with me. All right. You shouldn't even have a doubt about that. Why did you even look at me like, you know, what in the world? Uh, and so, but I mean, this bus is just, this is a rough thing, man. I'm with some rough people. I mean, we're halfway down. We're down there driving around. The bus driver looks up. He says, all right, whoever's smoking the Marahoochee, you got to put it out, you know. I mean, this is the bus we're on, all right? You know, I mean, it's not a California, I mean, it's not a Colorado bus. It's a Texas bus, okay? So that was unusual for that to be there. And so uh, I'll never forget riding, riding that bus, and I'm just a young kid. I get off that bus at the bus station on Avenue C uh, in Colleen, Texas. This is the roughest group. Now, listen, this is in the 70s, okay? You know, barely, this is like, you know, 79, almost 1980. Actually, it was just turning 1980, okay? And so, I, I mean, and I'm getting off this bus. The guy that's running the terminal has no shirt on, his hair down to his bottom back here, okay? And he's running this terminal. And I, I get off this bus. I'm a kid, and down here with all the, the ladies of the night, and, I, and, I, and I'm down here with all of this group, and I'm in this crowd, and finally, this officer from the Army steps up, and he says, Leslie Cole, I'm here for you. He saved me that day, I feel like. I mean, he called me. I have never been so glad for somebody to call out my name. I mean, I just like ran to him, you know, and jumped in his arms and, and, you know, hugged him. And like, I'm so glad you're here. It's the military. They've saved me, you know. And, you know, I mean, you'd have to come in there in a Hummer just to get out of there alive. And it was a crazy place down there. I'll, I'll never forget that experience. But no matter where you find yourself, no matter what you face, Jesus is, is the kind of Savior. He comes to save you. He rescues us. He, he rescues us. That's just his nature. That's just what his job. That's just what he wants to do. He says, I will save you. And we have that promise. We don't have to have phobophobia. Because we have this promise that whatever we face, Jesus is the one that saves us. But he not only does he say in the scripture, I will save you, he also says, I will be with you. I don't just save you, but I stay with you. I walk with you. I'm with you. I carry you. I'm beside you. I'm behind you. Uh, I make you victorious. I make you, con I make you a conqueror, actually. Okay? And so the scripture says in, in Isaiah 41.10, it says, don't be afraid. Again, don't be afraid. Don't be scared to death. I am with you. Don't tremble with fear. I am your God. I will make you strong. 
as I protect you with my arm and give you victories. He promises to give us victories. He promises to protect us. He will be with you. Jesus rescues us. He saves us. That's his nature. That's what he does. That's what he wants to do for us. He is with us no matter what. Now, we have, we approach evangelism in a really bizarre way sometimes, okay? Sometimes we approach evangelism in a weak way, in a watered-down way, and God doesn't want us to do that. He wants us to be straight up. The reality is people need God, and they need him now. and They need God in their lives to make a difference in the lives that they're living. Without him, we won't, they won't make it. Okay? Now, we have a tendency in church nowadays to kind of be in a situation where someone's out off of the shore in the ocean in rough waters. They they've, were on a ship and moving somewhere or on a boat in their lives, and somehow that boat broke down, and they had became shipwrecked, and they became broken. Their relationships are broken. Their life is broken. Life's a mess. And they've been thrown basically off of that shipwreck and now they're in the water. Okay? Now, what we tend to do as a church is we tend to swim out there to them. And here they are in this rough sea and they're maybe drowning. Boy, we swim right up to them, right up beside them, and we say this to them. We say, hey, I want you to know that I'm with you. I'm right here with you today. I'm right here beside you. You know what they're saying? I don't need you just to be beside me. I need someone to swim out here and not be with me. I need someone to swim out here and grab hold of me and tug me and drag me back to a place where I can be in the presence of safety, in the presence of God. See, if we're not careful, we're just kind of soft shoeing a situation where somebody really needs someone to be straight up with them and say, I know what you need. You need God in your life today. And they need that. They feel that. They're, 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 they're just drowning in their situations. Like, do, do, do you, you know, I'm just here with me. You're here with me? Listen, I'm drowning right now. I need something more than that. I need you to be in it with me. I need you to grab hold of me and hang on to me and give me life. I need to be protected. And God says, I'm not just going to save you. God says, I'm going to give you victory over what you're facing. You're going to overcome this. You're going to get the strength to swim out of this. You're going to make it back to shore. You're going to stand beside God on solid ground. You're going to be okay. Put your fear behind you. Let it go. It's going to be okay. You're going to make it. And he says, I will be with you. I will save you. And then finally he says this, I will help you. Psalms 118.6 says, I will not be afraid because the Lord is with me. The Lord is with me to help me. So I will see my enemies defeated. You see, whenever you know God is in it with you, then it's the time to start looking at things differently and say, you know what? I need to see my fear defeated. I need to see me victoriously. I'm not seeing myself right. And if you don't learn to see yourself the way God sees you, you will never overcome the things in your life that God wants to help you overcome. Sometimes it's just a matter of perspective. I've got to change my perspective. I'm not looking at things from God's perspective he's here to help me now you have to see the enemy before you can defeat the enemy it's hard to fight an enemy that I can't see if we're not careful you know what we do spiritually we just close our eyes and start swinging and we don't hit anything we're just fighting the air we're just swinging through the air we don't see the enemy we don't know who the enemy is Years and years ago, the Miami Dolphins were a new football team in the NFL, and they were the worst team in the NFL. They had a new coach, Don Shula, that showed up back in the 70s for the Dolphins. And he said this. He walks into this group of professional football players, professional men, and he says this. He says, guys, I'm going to help you become champions. You know what they did? They laughed at him. They thought it was the funniest thing they'd ever heard in their lives. Here's what he said. 
He said, you know how we're going to do it? He said, we are going to know the enemy that we face backwards and forwards. And we're going to develop a game plan that will overcome that enemy. And we're going to execute that game plan to perfection. Just a few short years later, he leads this team to a championship in a national football league. God will help you overcome, but you've got to see the enemy. You've got to open your eyes to what Satan is doing to you. You've got to open your eyes to the destruction around you, and you've got to realize that the only way I can have victory and the only way I can overcome this situation if God himself enters into my life through Christ and begins to help me deal with the situation, overcome the situation. And if you do that, the scripture, according to the scripture, your practical promise is you will have victory in your life. Do you believe it? Do we trust it? Do you walk with it? Do you let it become a part of your life? If you do, if you do, you'll have nothing to fear. Your phobia will be gone. Your phobophobia will be gone. And you won't have anything to fear anymore. If we will just trust God. Let's bow our heads together for prayer at this time. Now, with your head bowed, let me talk to you just a second. Just a time of reflection really quick. I don't know what you're facing, but I know you're facing something that's brought fear into your life. And that fear has frozen you up. And I know this, that you need the promises of God if you're ever going to get delivered from that. The scripture says that we can be free from that. We can let that go. But we can only do it through the power of Christ in our lives. We can only do it when we have a relationship with the one who is before it all, who is above it all, and has authority of it all. We can only accomplish that if we're connected and we have a relationship to the one that will save us, be with us, and will help us. We can only overcome the fear in our life if we have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and if we trust him and if we walk in that. So here's what I'm telling you today. With your heads bowed in just this time of reflection, take whatever it is, take whatever fear you have, whatever brokenness you might have in your life because of your fear, and I want to encourage you through just the quietness of your heart, through prayer, take it to the foot of the cross. Take it to the Mount of Calvary where Jesus died for your sin and leave it there. Leave it there. Let it go to God. Maybe you don't even have a personal relationship with God right now. You know you can. All you got to do is ask him to come into your heart. All you have to do is say, Lord, save me. Forgive me of my sin. Come into my life. Forgive me. Change me. Help me become more the person that you want me to become. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. And I will commit myself to you. The moment you do that, the scripture says you move from death to life. Maybe you just need to claim life today. Today made me the day that you say, I'm going to live. I'm going to live for God. I'm going to truly choose life today. If that's your decision, why don't you just make it right now? Just right now. I'll just give you a few minutes to do that. Just a few seconds for you to commit yourself, commit your life to Christ. Let him have it. Turn it over to him. Get rid of your fear today. Leave here today, as the scripture told us, free of fear. Psalms 34, 4. Pray, it says. Pray for the Lord to free you, to free you from your fears. Do that right now. All right, let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus. And God, we just um, ask that we open our hearts up to him. We ask, God, that you deliver us from all of our fear, that we'll walk confidently, uh, trusting you, depending on you, knowing that our future all lies in you. 
And God, I pray that we won't get caught looking around at the distractions all around us, but we'll really stay focused on your kingdom and your your presence in our life. And we'll trust you because, God, we know that you have the sovereignty and the grace to take care of us in ways that we can't even imagine. So focus us better on you. God, give us the victories. Help us to overcome. Help us to trust you. Help us to walk hand in hand with you in life. Build inside of us the depth of spirituality that you want us to have. And God, we promise that in all the good things that happen from that, we're going to give you the credit and the praise and the honor and the glory. And we just give it all to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, guys. Thank you today.